Well, today we are at the Elbert County Museum in the Exhibition Building. It's a beautiful fall day in October, and we I have two gentlemen here, and they are going to walk do a walk through the Exhibition Building and talk about some of the interesting old pieces of equipment that were used on the rural farms and the tools that were needed to repair the machinery and so on. And as we know, the farm was the center of life in the rural community. It held the community together, it held the family together, and it's sad that today the family farm, many of them are no more, because years ago it was succession. You know, great-grandfather's farm, then grandfather's farm, then father's farm, and so on. And so we have so many tools and things here that if we don't record what they were, what they were used for, that information is going to be lost and and uh, at a museum we our duty is to preserve the information and to educate and it's sad that so many of the younger generation do not know too much about the firm and that that actually built Canada so we have Mr. Grant Colpitz, okay, who grew up on a farm, and he'll tell you many interesting stories. And we have Tim Bathurst, who is very familiar with, the, with this equipment. So these two men are going to do a walkthrough and uh, share information, important information about the equipment. The uh, equipment here at the museum is, uh, and, and as a museum, we do know that it's uh, for the older equipment and for to keep memories of alive of what's happened in agriculture. And a lot of these inventions here, or these equipments, was came because most people, farmers, and I'm going to call them, were, they weren't lazy because they're hard workers, but they were thinkers to think, to make things easier for themselves. So a lot of these inventions was things that made life easier for them on the farm, and, be, and became a commercial thing, and that's what it is. I'm holding here is a dike spade, and basically that is for out on the marshlands, where they tried to, to take this, this little machine, and so they did it by hand. And a lot of times that it was a way for pay off taxes too, to build these dikes to save the land so it could be used for agriculture, and they were also used after the dikes were built, they were used to dig drains to keep the water. If rain or tides come in, they had different systems of doing that. But as I said, most of the equipment that we have here was basically from being lazy. And you talked about cutting different products, whether it be this for grain or corn. You grow it, and then you want to feed it to your cattle. Before, they'd have to go out with a big knife or some kind to cut it. But then all of a sudden somebody comes up with an idea. Once they could do manufacturing, they'd come up with a nice little s swerving thing so that they could uh, make it easier to, to harvest as they went along. And you'll find the most of the, of the equipment that's here is just manufactured on that basis along that line. Now, we'll uh, come up with some other little equipments, and I don't care whether you were talking about the uh, cattling for eggs, for example. A lot of farmers would be raising eggs, and inside the egg, quite often, you would get a little blood in there. And lots of times the neighbors didn't like that. So the farmer says, Well, how am I going to find it? You can hold it up to lights if you want, but you can't see it as well. So they ended up with a little box with a light inside of it, and so that the light would shine up through and it would show you whether that egg had blood in it or not. And then you would take that off, eat it yourself at home, because nothing was wrong with it, but, uh, when, but you didn't give it to the neighbor or sell it to because you wanted to keep your eggs in good shape, because you washed them and everything. Well, just little things that they made themselves, but later on companies manufactured them. And then it became quite a, quite a thing. And then we, everybody gets to complaining, my eggs are awful small. I don't, and, and basically when you start out raising your hens, the, the pullets would lay smaller eggs, and then all of a sudden you start getting bigger eggs and you get double yoked eggs and things. But then they ended up with a little scale so that they can have a little weight, put the egg on for a different weight, and you had different size eggs so that if long comes 
Tim here, and he wants larger eggs, and they had they had certain weights that they called large eggs. Well, and you'll see them in stores today. It says on there extra brown, brown, extra larger, and then there's large and smalls along that line. And that's a good way, too, for upping the price on things, too, you know. You get a little bigger egg, you should pay a little more. Okay. Yeah. What have you got there now? No, uh, uh, I know what you think, uh, Tim. This is probably one of those ray guns for outer <laughs> space for, for the modern day, but it is not. This is a, a thing that made it simpler for planting potatoes. And you actually cut this, your potato seeds up. Let's make sure the eye, remember they tell you, make sure everything has an eye. You put them in here as your little hopper. And then you took the machine, put it in the ground. And this is so you could put your foot to push it down. And then as it hit the ground, this little lever opens it up to allow the, the potato seed to go in. Now you may get two in there, but that, that really didn't make any difference. That meant you get more potatoes off of that hill and you kept moving. But it was just a, a simple way for one person to save carrying a bucket, save having to pick up the bucket, move each time and drop it down and have a spade. This, this took care of the shovel, the bucket for carrying the seed and the way to give you a seed to move from down the aisle, down the row. And remember that on the farms years ago, the potatoes were staple. It was, it was something that everybody had on the table. And no matter what they, they had with any meal, everybody had potatoes. And if you didn't have potatoes, you always went on to the neighbors to eat instead of at home, yeah, along that line. So that's what it is, Tim. There you go. Look here, Tim, what we found here hanging yep. up here. And this is basically that the farmer had with his sheep. <laughs> And you would have a sheep, and uh, sometimes you'd want to separate one out. I don't care whether we're going to shear it or whether we're going to uh, take it for market or what. But it was just a shepherd's hook they talk about. And they would hook that around the sheep's neck. And once you deal with sheep, you just hold them under the chin, and you can handle them very easy. And basically, that's what the cane did. And you could reach in a group and pull them out. Now, sometimes the uh, grandfather might sit there and use this as a cane, but when the kid went by, he'd grab the kid by the leg sometimes just to, to upset the grandchild, That's basically. True, yeah. So when we did get this sheep hooked here, Tim, we better start getting that wool off of it. He's doing and, something with that. That's yes. why we've got this. So this, that we've, this would be the first ones that would come out, and they come out uh, and they can do this by hand. And that was so, a lot of work. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, and you know, I'm, I don't like work too often. <laughs> And I like to be a little lazy. So what I, what we did, we invented a little rig like this where you can crank it, and they had little hooks, uh, blades on here, and it ended up that you could hold that, yep. and I would crank it, and you could the shear sheep, the sheep. The sheep. Yep. And it saved you using those other clips that you had there, yep. and the other mm -hmm. hand saved you using those. It just made things more easier on the farm. And so that then you can take the wool in and get the socks made for the women. That's what the women did. They so in, carted the, the, the wool for yeah. different things along that line. So really what we're talking is that uh, necessity is the invention of... Uh, or yeah. Tools were made because they just wanted to get something done but, faster. Yeah. And, but it's really interesting, you know, most of the animals, that you, you, you did the animals and... and with sheep and things, you, you usually had them at home. But cattle, lots of times, people pastured cattle together. And for example, in, in Alva County here, then, in Caledonia Mountain and, and uh, New Ireland and those areas, they let cattle go. I would bring my herd over and, and let them go, or you could bring yours. And everybody, at one time, we had to know where the cattle were. And you'd have what they call on the bell cow. And she was the one that you could hear this in the woods. You could always find them wherever they're in. And these bells, you would have them on yours, I'd have it on one eye, maybe a couple of cows. And uh, there was a different sound of that bell. And you knew exactly. And, and sometimes when I, if, if I took two to 10 animals up there, then those 10 animals would tend to stay together because of the sound of the bell. And it just, it just made a, a difference. And, and if you had 10 or 15, yours would be. Yep. But yet, sometimes they all stayed together and, and along that line. Now, we, you had different calls. You know, we talked about pasture and cattle. Last time, you'd, you'd have to go see your cattle once in a while. If you're an owner, you, you want to know how your cattle are doing on pasture, you could go down and holler. 
you get, you, and your voice. They get used to the voice and they knew when you hollered on a particular day, but it was always was Sunday anyway, Sunday after church, and uh, they, they would expect you there. When you hollered, they knew you had feet. And like people with horses, you know, darn, you can go out the, the old bucket, give it a little tap, and the horse will come. You could have a different bucket with a different sound, and your horse would come. Course, Mine the, wouldn't. The whole, the whole thing is with that is that all these buckets, all these bells were all made on the farm. That, uh, they weren't gone to the store. You didn't go to the store to yeah, buy them. They yeah, didn't have them. That's right. They so, weren't, weren't like a dog whistle that, that you buy in the store. Now right. they all sound the same. Yeah, but, they do not. They're all different yeah. than long Latin. So it was just a way for the for uh, people to to raise their animals and and the animal husbandry. We'll call it that line. And they really would uh, take care of them and feed them so that the animals, so they knew what was going on. It, they, they always did yep. that. And we, I can remember as a kid going, and uh, it was a Sunday trip, and you always took a bag of feed and just to bring them around so that the animals knew that, you know, yeah. that they were healthy and still yeah. there wasn't something happened to them. And you could see what was going on with them. You could you see know, what the and, disease And they knew that uh, you were still interested not, yeah. in them, really. But anyway, those are just things that, that people made just, just to keep their the animal husbandry alive and, and make sure that the health and everything of their animals were of good use. You know, we've gone through the, uh, the animal side of it. Uh, we have the agricultural side of it with the, uh, the garden here. And this is a garden rake. Uh, it's hand made again. And they drive, I don't know whether you can see that, but there's nails on the top of it that are driven in. And they can rake the, the garden, take all the uh, weeds and grass out of the garden and uh, just go down through the rows with this rather than uh, doing it by hand. So uh, that's that side and you've got the, uh, the field. Now this, on the field we showed you before a, a dike shovel, whether you're out and keeping the dikes drained and keeping the, the marshes dry. Now when you mowed the hay, lots of the hay would lay in those ditches and if you leave it there, it would plug those ditches in time and you'd have to go back out again and dig them up. Well, this this type of fork is is here is a, it's all made of wood, and these are just little wood dolls driven down in there, and it's a rake for reaching. And it, and it it's it's a long handle. That you can see the handle is and it's nice and smooth so that you can reach and pull it, and it slides back and forth on your hand. Now, of course, in those days most of them wore gloves and things along that line, but it was there to keep that marsh clean and. And you did not waste a sprig of hay. You, when people mowed hay, they went and collected them up, and then they went into the field afterwards and re-raked it. Lots of times these were used for re-raking if you had enough in the family to do that. Or you used a horse and a rake, and, and you came to with a hay loader. And this was also used for making windrows for the hay loader that was dragged along behind the, the hay thing. And that was basically it. Now the other one is after you got the grain, and you're using the uh, swather and, and you've got your sheaths all tied up and everything and then piles, then this was a type of homemade fork that you could reach and lift the sheath. The sheath laid right on top of it and, and, and to throw it into the thrasher. It would save a lot of times if you grab in your hand. You could handle it a lot easier and it was easier and you didn't lose as much grain by doing this. When you get it in your hand, you had a tendency to when you got ready to throw it, you shake the grain off it, and you lost grain. But this had a tendency to make it just more grain, more more grain out of it. But that, that's again the invention of, of, of uh, laziness, I guess, to keep from doing. Then, of course, you have to have to have family dues, you know. And, and uh, when you went blueberry picking, you know, everybody had to have a blueberry rake, they called it. And, and when we first started out, you picked them by hand. It, uh, and that was never my fancy, I can tell you that. And I came from a family of uh, seven kids, and, and when they would go to pick cranberries or blueberries, mm -hmm. I'd stay home and do the chores, because I, I thought it was a lot easier doing that than, than running. This is before we had the rake. Well, then you had to bend over and do and it, And then it? later, when they got the rake, they left me home anyway. <laughs> they didn't want me around. But there was different ones. This is a, met, a metal one made, and it looks like it was homemade. Homemade, all right. And then you have other ones. Here's, this is for cranberries. And this is a wooden one, again, made for, for just to make it easier for you to pick. And in other words, you go out in the marshes and start picking cranberries. You, you did it by hand. And 
But then again, this one is a little different. We have looked at this one and kind of wondered if it was of its usefulness, basically, because there's a little bag that sort of had a tendency to, to pick it up, and it's called for blueberries. And I felt that it had to be something to do with higher bush blueberries, because if you drop this along the ground, you'd bruise the berries quite badly on this. So it's a, a little bag, of, and by the looks of it, I wouldn't say it was used that much, because there's hardly any stains on it, whether it be red or blue. So I would say that somebody that invented this found it maybe not just as good as they had thought it was going to be. But those were things that, that families and things did, so to make it easier for to get things to preserve, you need preserves and things along that line. Again, those are just things that you used on the farm when you needed them. The farmer's equipment is just as important to them as the, the uh, looking after the livestock, the husbandry of the animals. So a lot of them would, would have grindstones that they had. And these, these grindstones, most of them that are in here, probably came from what they call Grindstone Island, where they did mining there. Mm -hmm. And they got the grindstones, and a lot of those were shipped all over the world. But a lot of the farmers had these, and the thing of these things, it was, a, it was in a family event when it came to sharpening. No matter what you are sharpening, whether it would be the shears for sheep or, or chisels or, or hats or something, you always had one of the kids that had to turn the wheel, keep it going, the handle on that side, just turn that up away from him and just see the handle along that line. And also, why the father, usually, was, was doing the grinding, or the older brother, was doing the sharpening here. Somebody, other kid, was standing there with a little water spout that kept water on this so that it would sharpen it better. And he always did that with whetstones. And even the whetstones that had handles, you, you had a pail that you dipped it in and you sharpened these. No matter what kind of a slope you had, how you sharpened that way, this way, along that way so that they'd always get them. And then you'd have a, a, a hatch and the things, and they'd be held on this back side here in order to get that slope on the right side so that, so that you could hack away at, at the harder grounds and things along that line. But it was just to keep the tools, whether it be the knife in the kitchen for, the, for his wife or whether it was one for butchering animals on the farm, it was there. This machine was always there. There were different various sized ones. There's different sized ones here. There's big ones, small ones, handmade ones. But it all depended on what the person wanted to accomplish on the, in his, doing his duties. Well, Tim, you know, on the farm, you know, most of these people that were in the country and farmers, they wanted money. And they liked to have That's a little important. extra, Tim. It's you know? kind of important. And a lot of them, in the, in the, particularly in Albert County, they started off and started in the fox business. And it was a, a, a good industry. It started out in the basic 30s, 1930s, and then it sort of petered off a little bit in later in the mid-30s mm -hmm. in, the, in the Depression time. And then the, it went on to about 1945. And then we'll call it the bottom fell out of it, when you were probably getting 100 or $200 a pelt early, but then all of a sudden it dropped down to $5. And uh, these, these uh, type of things, uh, but some of us held on. My family held on to it, and we raised foxes along that line. And they, they have different pelts that you have, different colored ones. Everybody tried to, to get a different color, kept breeding, catching red foxes, crossing them with domesticated ones. Uh, the biggest one was the silver fox, of course. And uh, many people out in, in the country had a, a small ranch, you know, maybe they might have five, six foxes. Just, to, they're trying to make just a little extra money on the farm and all over the county and all, well, all over the province, basically, along that one. But in the, but the meantime, all the, as the fox thing went on, you had fox shows and uh, uh, it was fashion, right? Mm -hmm. You had the uh, women's coats and collars and, and uh, trims and all that. and. Uh, and many things. So you had fox shows so that you could have a competition also to find out what your neighbor had and, uh, and you needed new breeding stock so you could see those things. And, and many of the foxes, you had boxes, tack boxes, the same idea as horse people or cattle when you go to shows. And, and with those, of course, you have to have, when you're handling foxes, you don't want them biting you. So there's, there's basically an older muzzle up there. Those were awkward to put on, but then they came up with the nice fancy little ones that you could slide. The fox would bite it, 
and then sort of clamp his mouth down. And it was also used that if you came on my ranch and wanted to buy a fox or something, and you wanted to feel the fur, you didn't just take my word for it, you wanted to feel it yourself, then you could put the muzzle in so you could rub the fur all the fox anywhere and he couldn't bite you. He, you know, he might try to, but he, would, but he wouldn't. You, you, uh, all, every fox was marked, and particularly back in the years, uh, first started their purebreds, so get into purebreds, so they all had to be tattooed. And there was a tattoo kit where you had uh, different things, and you tattooed them in the year. And basically, the ranch had a number. Every ranch had a number. And it could be, you know, mine was RF, RFK, and, uh, and then another part of the ranch was an RFB. But if they were not registered, we always put, like, a, my father's initials in it, LAC. So we knew it was not a registered fox. And, but then, but there was a number. And there was also a letter. Each letter represented the year. So that you knew how old that fox was. Or if you was buying it, you knew that if I saw you a fox that was K, it was a certain year. And if it was a, and then now or an M or, or a P, you knew it was a, a younger one than the one that I tried to sell you as a pup. And it actually wasn't a pup. And those are, that, it was there for, for the registration for purebred. That was a Canadian uh, Fox Breeders Association, and they had an organization in Canada, head office in Summerside PEI, as a matter of fact. So you did have various things. There was different needles. You, you had needles also with the pelt get ripped. Uh, you, when you, sometimes they would be fighting and tear themselves, and so when you, uh, when you harvested the pelt, then the, it would rip open, so you have to sew it up so that you could put it on, so at least it would pass uh, some of the inspection, but they always found them when, the, when it came to inspection time. Then you had the, each, each grade of fur, furs, some was good grades, A, B, C's, and, and things, and there's little tags that the Canadian fur breeders put under the fur, so that the buyers would look and know that color was a certain standard, then you had other colors along, along that line. The biggest thing was feeding, was feeding, and, and uh, we have a box here, this is a raw trite box, for fox food. And these, tripe was basically a real delicacy of food, particularly in the, for the Japanese people and also for other people in Europe, and the, you know, because they eat the, more horse meat than we do too. And this, sometimes it, they couldn't sell it all, and so the fox ranchers was a, an out for them to get rid of their oversupply that was not good for food. So they would put it in boxes, send them down at 25 pounds. And, little 20 pound boxes and sometimes it was froze, sometimes it wasn't and along that line and boys it was great you could take it out and uh, feed it raw you fed it raw to the foxes and they just it was a delicacy to them also along that line if they come to little boxes like that and you usually ship those boxes back so that it's like the other thing the interesting there was very many different breeds of foxes different colors and they and now it gets into the fancy. You kept trying to do that along that line. But then again, the, the, the business come back in in the late 70s and stayed probably till about 90. And then, then again, we say the bottom fell out of it. But in the meantime, mink took over. And mink uh, fur became a very high price. But then again, in the last few years, the, the price of mink had dropped down. So fur trade. But that is the... the uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, a fashion, fashion demands along that line. I, at one time, when you took a pelt, they would use it to make a coat. They'd use the whole pelt. And so therefore, they, they had to buy good fur. So there was a difference between good fur and poor. But later on, the fur industry, people became smart. They could buy a cheaper fur on the market and then cut it in strips and take the good parts of it and sew it together to make a and look like a pelt so that they can make a coat. And consequently, they were using a, a cheaper material, but still selling it at that nice high price. And, the, and that did affect the fur industry and did slow it down to, for producers. So it ended up that you could produce anything and still sell it for, and, and the price got lower. And that was the problem. Now that it, it's spring of the year, now it, you have to imagine you're doing your gardening. And of course, that's a very important thing on the farm because uh, the family needed to be fed, and also you didn't only feed the family, but you fed relatives and neighbors and traded things back and forth. So when you started planting the thing, you have to make the rows, you had to go down, usually you had a stick and you drug it down the middle to make a little 
trench to put the seed, and then you come along with the seed and spread it out by hand. And then when the plants started to grow, you had to thin it out. Well, you know, it, that's quite a bit of work, and you have enough work to do on the farm as it is, because you're going from daylight to dark. But this little, somebody has come up with what they call a precision planting machine for planting. And this is a homemade, made out of wood. The most of it is wood. This is metal part that you put your seeds in. And they made a little, this, this, you wheel this down the middle of your row. This would make the little trench. Here, the, as the wheels turned, this thing turned and out through little holes, and out came the seed, whether it be radish, carrots, various seeds, and they would be spaced out so that when the plant was all, your garden is planted, then you didn't have to go out and thin them out, particularly turnips and carrots, and, and beets, you yeah, has another one. But this just made it that much simpler. And don't forget that as your family got larger or got older and they started eating more, your garden became now not just 20 foot rows, they were 50 foot rows. And that, that saved a lot of, this saved a lot of bending over, a lot of weeding and a lot of thinning. I guess not weeding so much, you still had to weed, but the thinning part. And this machine made it that much simpler. Now somebody invented this and, and that was a good idea for him. But then all of a sudden, all the neighbors wanted one and he was not going to make it for them. And that's where company steps in. And the company steps in and they come up with another machine. Because it all becomes little precision plantings along this line. It's the same, almost the same thing. Here's where the seeds goes in, the seeds went in there. This is the one that made the furrow down the middle of the row. And this here came along and patted it down again. And it became a commercial thing. And of course, there's different adjustments on the sides and things along that line for the different heights is that if a taller person was running or a shorter person like myself, that could be adjusted for them. But it was a precision planting. And this just saved a lot of extra time because we talked about the farmers and we talked about the farmers' days and starting early in the morning to get up. You know, and we say sunrise, sometimes they're up before sunrise and they had the work to do and they worked until the sun went down from daylight to dark. And, and those were just, it was just a thing that they had, they had to do. And, and uh, those days, they didn't have too much other entertainment besides maybe you might have a box social or something around town or something that you'd all go to and something along that line. But these were things that people thought of just to make work a little bit lighter for themselves and the family. Once you've got your uh, grain all harvested, we've got to do something with it. And basically when you're bringing in the sheaths, and uh, this is where you bring it to in order to get your grain out of those. But basically this machine is usually set up along with other things as powered, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, about the uh, different ways of, of using horses and things to power it. The, usually the wagon comes in on the other side, they fork the, the sheaths down on here, and then the machine is turning, and it goes on through here, and it's sort of uh, crushed and moved around, shaken as it goes through to shake the grain off of the, well, it's our oats mostly, and they're talking about here, and then it goes on through the machine, and we'll get the, the other end there in a few minutes. But this is where it starts. You put the grain here, and it goes through and take the grain out. Grant, you've uh, explained about putting the sheaves in and coming through. What else have we got? Okay, what, what happens here, the grain comes through here and it's sort of being they, they bunched together and it's also going in, in here is, is the fork needles like things that pull the hay through and sort of shakes it. Mm -hmm. And they're shaking the grain off so it falls down to the machine. And now it becomes what we have just left over is the straw. The grain has dropped off it, we got straw, and the straw gradually works its way back and goes out in the end. Of course, this machine is more than just a one-man machine here. It's several men, because you've got a man there that's working the, the, the chaff away, if you want to call it, or the, or the straw. In the meantime, you're going to have people collecting grain right here, because the grain goes down below. And it's all done to... The biggest thing here is vibration. 
and things. And you don't mind this machine vibrating, where today we don't want machines to vibrate, but these, this we need it because it, it helps clean the grain, it helps get the grain off the off of the plant and everything so that it's ready to be used for animal feed. Well, we've got the grain hauled here, Tim. And now is the thing we're putting it through the, we talked about putting it through the thrasher and all that and getting the grain. But then we wonder, well, just how do we get there? And we use a motor, actually, one horsepower. <laughs> As you said, it's uh, probably a 1,700-pound <laughs> horse. There's one horse, and you put the horse into this machine, and the horse walked. And a continuous, uh, just a continuous walk, uh, not a fast walk or anything, and it, and it kept everything turning, and especially turned the big wheel right behind you there, Tim. And it turned that, and there would be the big belt, could be leather, it could be canvas, and the, and the big belt ran over to the thresher underneath this pad here and up on this. And this is the main wheel that turned the thrasher, kept the grain going through, and then, of course, down below is built with a vibrator that cleaned out the seeds and things along that line. And, but it was, the big thing was that the power was done by horsepower, because we didn't have big motors then. And that's uh, probably around the same time that the steam engines had started out, a little small steam engine that most of the farmers would have along that line. But that was the horse that was the main thing. And they had different horses. They changed horses from time to time. They, it isn't the cruelty of making a horse do it all. They knew that the horse can only do so much and that's it. We uh, talked about before, Tim, about the grain and stuff, putting it through the thrasher and using the horse to run the machine. But basically, this is a machine we're looking at here now is a horse-drawn machine, and it's basically used for reaping or cutting the grain, and getting it ready to go to be put into sheaths and things so that you can put it through the thrasher. Now, these, this machine, basically operates the grain. You, there's a cutter bar along the bottom here, and, and the, these paddles that you'll see here, there's four of them, and they go around, and they continuously go around, and they lift at the back along that line. And the driver of the, driver of the uh, machine, he uh, sits over back driving the horses, and so these, these machines here, the, the big paddles, are run by this mechanism right here. And what happens, there's a, a slope and they're running on little round wheels. And it goes down, and they keep this down, so that it pushes the grain into the cutters. And when it comes back, there's a, the back part is, comes up, so that it lifts these up, so it does not hit the driver, is basically what it's for. And then you're cutting the grain, and sometimes the grain goes back and falls off there, and then they can tie. Some people, you'll have people who come along and tie them. And then sometimes you used to have uh, uh, machines that are more modern than this, where you stood in the back and, and you tie them and threw them off and make them sheep. Now this is probably one of the first mechanized machines that was on farms, and particularly the ones that they had the old hand size before. They had to cut them and then tie them up, but that sure took away from a lot of manpower, took away a lot of work for them, so that they had time to do other things. The manure spreader was probably one of the first machines I would say mechanized on the farms, but uh, other than that, this must run real close to it. This is really mechanized because you've got all sorts of adjustments in there that you can't see, but they, they can adjust the size of the, or the, the height of the cutters and, and the whole work. Yeah. So they can, uh, depending on the slope of the land. But one thing we didn't mention as we talked about these machines all the time is the need for greaser and oil. They must have had a, a lot of it because you sure needed it because everything was running on iron and iron, steel on steel, wood on wood and things. And you needed something to keep everything running smoothly. And the sure they were people who maintained their equipment because they didn't have a lot of money to spend and the, these machines came from a long distance away. This is the old McCormick, actually. On one side it says McCormick, and then on the side it says McCormick Daisy. So that's going way back in the, in the McCormick days. This machine here is basically what they call a chaff cutter. If you different terms you can use. It's actually a, a seed cleaner, is basically, and sizer. 
And what you do is you have different sizes of oats. For example, oats will you, when you have it, there's bigger seeds and, and it all has screening in here. And as it goes through, the, remember what I said about some other machines, there's a tremendous amount of vibration as these machines work all the time. And that's where that grease and oil comes in all the time we talk about. And these you put, once you put the grain in the top, it comes down through, it's shaking it through, different sizes are going to be coming out of different spouts. Down below will be the chaff, the waste that, that's not needed for anything. Sometimes they use it in the old days for insulation in houses, down in the old wooden houses. That's where a lot of the hulls and stuff, and, and, and it was asked about the hulls. The hulls, hulls are going to be removed here also. And that's really what, what it was used for. Now, the grain here, it gives you different sizes, and I mentioned that there was a regulation years ago in regards to grain, and in fact, if I want to sell you seed grain, I had to have the, the weeds removed from it as much as possible. And there's only a certain allowance of certain, once they took a sample, they could find, you know, up to 5% or something, like that. you were allowed to do 5, 10, but you had to advertise that how much weed was, was in there. And of course, most of the time we want it weedless. We didn't want any weeds because there's no way to get it weedless. But the, once the grain went through here, it was now ready for sale. It could be sold to another farmer for seed. This seed could be also shipped off. You can take the oats and stuff and make an oatmeal and things along that line. Crushed oats for animals or for humans. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're going right back to the kitchen again. And the wife always says the backbone. Then she would take this grain and that would end up giving you the porridge for early morning.